Hey everyone, I'm Mike Cook, and this is a paper I presented at the International Conference on Computational Creativity in Salamanca in Spain in 2018. It's a little bit different from my usual research talks. Um, it's a paper, as the title suggests, about other communities of people that make generative software. Um, but uh, hopefully it'll be interesting to you whether or not you're from those communities maybe, or you're from computational creativity and just kind of want to learn about them. Um, it's, uh, it's obviously about those communities, but it's also a way of introducing um, people who might, might be more from an academic AI background um, and teaching them about amazing people and amazing work that's out there. Um, and also giving us an opportunity to kind of reflect on the way we run our community, things that we can learn from other people um, and from other communities, and, and maybe ways that we can reach out and, and join them. Um, the way I've been thinking about this talk is uh, it reminds me a lot of the conversations I tend to have um, in the bar at the end of the day at a conference, um, except now instead of gushing to one or two people about these events, um, I can just tell the whole conference at once. So it's a massive time saver. So without further ado, um, the first community that I want to look at is ProcJam. Um, now, ProcJam is a little bit different from the other three that I'm talking about today um, because I'm actually involved in organizing it. Um, so uh, I'm a little bit biased, and I guess I know the most about this event. So um, I'm, I'm sorry if you feel like the other three events are maybe not given as much justice. I've tried to, to give them all a kind of equal focus. Um, but uh, ProcJam is an annual nine-day event. So um, it, it has impact across the whole year, as we'll see in a minute. But the main focus are these intense events where people make generative things, um, and usually from scratch, so they start from nothing. Um, 2018 is its fifth year, it started about five years ago, um, and it was initially completely video games focused, um, which is why it says procedural generation, because this is a term um, that game developers are more familiar with. Um, but we've tried to back away from that over the time, and now we have people coming in from every medium um, making generative software in all kinds of domains. Um, to give you an idea of the size, in 2017, um, almost 700 people signed up for the jam. That doesn't mean that all of them necessarily built something for the jam. We had 174 finished submissions. Some people will have started working and not submitted, and some people won't have started at all. Um, but uh, that gives you a rough idea of how many people are sort of in the periphery of ProcJam. Um, now, many of my slides have cool illustrations of nice things, and I've realized that I kind of want to tell you what they are at the same time as talking about the slide. Um, so uh, I apologize if this talk kind of meanders a bit. Um, I've been trying to think about what the identifying features of these communities are, and a big one for ProcJam is that um, we've tried to build and support the community with whatever resources we could scrape together as organizers. Um, this is a, a tree generator from um, the summer ProcJam that we did for the first time that actually just finished uh, a week ago. Um, so by that I mean um, by supporting the community, for instance, uh, every year we put up a panel of expert talks. Um, sometimes they're recorded live. Um, last year we did something different where we got them to be pre-recorded in advance um, because uh, I, I had just moved country and I wasn't able to run a live event. Um, but what that means is that every year we add about six or seven half-hour talks from all kinds of people. Um, talking about generative software and they're honestly brilliant and they've created an amazing archive of resources for our community to learn from um, and not just our community but other people like educators tell me they give their students some of these talks to look at which is incredible um, so ProcJam is not just about this event that we hold it's also about the long-term impact we have on the world around us um, we also make uh, free art assets that we that we've given them um, we've hired artists to make them and then we give them away for free um, we run a zine, uh, Jupiter Hadley, one of our other co-organizers, um, edits this uh, magazine, and it's full of articles written by community members. Um, so we encourage people to write little blog-sized blog entries, and then uh, Jupiter lays them out in a big uh, PDF, um, and we uh, publish one every year. Um, and that's been going really well. Um, to give you a couple of kind of more in-depth examples of work from the jam, um, this was a piece from uh, last year's jam where someone tried to replicate the work of another artist using a generative software. So um, it's kind of supposed to be uh, cityscapes in a sort of abstract art style. Um, so this is a, a common thing that people do in ProcJam is to take a, a technique which is quite well known in generative software and, um, and then kind of learn how to do it for the first time. So there's lots of newcomers who come to ProcJam to practice something. Um, at the same time, lots of people come to do something completely unusual. So this is a game called Chaos Witch. 
Um, it randomly generates these cards that you see at the bottom of the screen. They have an impact on the game. And the objective is there's a battle happening between the red and the blue army. And I believe you have to keep the battle even for as long as possible. So you're reading these cards, which are randomly generated, and trying to figure out which one is going to rebalance the fight based on what's happening, um, which is an amazing idea. I really love it. Um, and this was uh, Dreamer of Electric Sheep which actually uses ConceptNet uh, to create a text adventure. So this was by Tom Coxon, who was one of our speakers, and um, I think he was inspired by hearing about some of the work we've done in computational creativity, funnily enough. Um, and so he hacked together this uh, ConceptNet-powered text adventure um, in just nine days. It was really impressive. And this actually uses Sprightly, funnily enough, to, to generate the artwork. Um, if you want to read more about ProcJam, you can go to ProcJam.com um, or, or check the ProcJam hashtag on Twitter. The hashtag is really cool right now because, like I said last week, uh, we just wrapped up a summer jam, so there's lots of content to look at. Sorry I have to move on so quickly. Um, I could spend ages talking about each one of these communities. Um, the next one up is Creative AI. Uh, so Creative AI is, as I've kind of put here, is, is a hashtag. Um, so it doesn't have an official founding date, really. Um, and it's kind of a loose community. I was actually talking um, to Alex Schampendard and Simon Colton about this yesterday. There isn't like a list of all the members of Creative AI or anything. Um, it's a very informal thing that people come in and come out of. There are several physical events that happen around the world based on um, membership of like people who hang out in, in this, these kinds of groups. Um, they've been involved in organizing workshops at NIPS, um, not just machine learning for creativity and design, but uh, I believe it was constructive machine learning. I'm going to have to check that before I give my talk later today. Uh, that's my bad. Um, and uh, they're very well known for things like the London Creative AI Meetup. Um, that's a big, big pit. So a key feature of this community is they're really interested in using AI techniques, especially cutting edge or emerging ideas, um, and finding ways to make them useful right now for creative and artistic ends. So there's not so much um, kind of waiting for this to filter down or waiting for like Adobe to integrate it into Photoshop or anything. Um, the, the people in this community see a new technique, they've got the technological know-how to understand how to use it, and they start immediately trying to apply it in interesting ways. So Janelle Shane is uh, very popular on Twitter. She uses neural networks to play with text, and she's done all kinds of stuff, like generating knock-knock jokes, um, combining uh, pie recipes with Dungeons and Dragons spells, um, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, you should actually totally follow her on Twitter. She's Janelle C. Shane, um, if you're there. Obviously, I don't need to, <laughs> anyway. I don't need to read this out. I need to read this out when I'm giving the talk live. Uh, that's uh, my mistake. Um, there's also evidence, we wrote about this in the paper, that the, this community has had an actual, like, real impact on the art world. So some of its members have exhibited work at very big galleries around the world. Um, this is work by Mario Klingerman. Um, uh, so this is, uh, we're actually going to look at a piece of his later as well. Um, and this is a pretty significant step. Like, this is this is showing that this community um, and people who, who work in it are having a big impact on the way that people think about artificial intelligence, which is really cool. Um, talking to Alex Schampendard this week, and one of the things that uh, he's mentioned in the industry panel as well is that there's a real focus on um, setting quite high standards for finished things that people are building. Um, there's not so much about bottom up and kind of slow uh, progress towards grand ideas. There's more of a kind of this is the this is the output we would like to have. This is the kind of high quality targets. How can we work towards that? Um, and kind of almost more of a product oriented. I don't want to say that because it kind of um, oversimplifies some of the approaches. But in some senses, more of a kind of a product oriented. In three months, we want to have something that looks this good. And how can we do that kind of thing? Um, this seemingly random illustration here is uh, from an NVIDIA project to generate faces. So this photograph does not really exist. Um, a machine learning system has. Uh, spat this out by looking at photos of celebrities. Um, obviously, I've been showing you some work, but just a couple more examples from the community. Um, this is X Degrees of Separation by Mario Klingerman. This was actually um, a single line of pieces. So um, I've split it up into two lines here, so it would fit on my slide nicely. But starting in the top left, what uh, this work does is it looks for art artworks which are similar to the piece on the left. So it's there's like a slow progress of change as the system searches for similar artworks. And you can kind of see this evolution, um, which is really cool. If you want to see more work by Mario, I highly recommend it. Quasimondo.com is um, their website. 
Um, also, I, th I think it, it uh, needs mentioning the Deep Forger is certainly one of uh, my favorite peep, uh, works from this field, um, from this community. Alex Champendard is um, the person behind that. And this was one of the early style transfer um, tools that was super accessible. So lots of people were experimenting with style transfer. But one of the things that, that set this apart was not just that um, Alex was updating it very often, but that um, it was uh, available to communicate with through a Twitter bot. And this really made it accessible to everyone, which was um, one of the most amazing things about it. Um, I believe it's inactive now. Um, Alex might be able to correct me on that, but you can still go and see some of its work and it's, it's very fun to look at. Twitter bots is the next community. Um, this is another community which is very close to my heart. Um, so, uh, you all know Twitter, you all hate Twitter. Um, it opened up its API about a year after it launched. Um, and today the word Twitterbot is um, heavily weighted and it means lots of different things. So for some people, it just means anything automated really. Um, for some people, it's kind of got a malicious term now. It's, it's you know scripts that spam adverts at you or um, if you're maybe more towards the American politics conspiracy theory, 50% um, of people on Twitter are, are Russian. Um, uh, but uh, to us, it's a, a script which generates content and posts it on Twitter, um, usually for artistic or nice purposes. Um, so many bots have had a real impact on kind of the culture of the world even, you know, they've had tens of thousands of followers. Um, we mentioned some of them in the paper and we we actually don't really have very good numbers on the size of this community. So one of the reviewers of the paper wanted to know how big these communities were and it's really hard for most of them. So for, for Twitter bots, um, one very important bot making website has 7,000 registered users and that's just users, that's not even Twitter bots and not everyone by any means signed up to that website. Like many people make bots elsewhere. Um, so you're looking at tens of thousands of people making Twitter bots, which is really exciting. Um, it's again, like Creative AI, it's a very loose community. The best approximation for the Twitter bot community is the hashtag bot ally or botally or any way you want to pronounce that. Um, but that's by no means the only um, group. Uh, it's just the, the main one that, that I'm aware of. There are many groups of people who make bots. There are many people who are completely individual making bots. Um, this uh, illustration is from an unusual bot. It's not generative so much, um, but there's definitely creativity um, in curating Twitter, I would say. So this bot uh, works in a very interesting way. It finds pairs of tweets that are anagrams of one another. So your laugh is so priceless is an anagram of suspiciously large horse. Um, if you follow Anagrammatron, it will retweet pairs of tweets like this on a regular basis. Um, major companies have built Twitter bots, so sometimes these are very trivial bots, but um, companies like Coca-Cola have been involved. Their experiments were often horrible mistakes that went wrong, like Microsoft's, um, but there have also been some really good ones. Wizards of the Coast, who are a, a role-playing game kind of, uh, I don't know how to describe them actually, they're, they're a design company, I guess. They make games like Magic the Gathering, um, and they did some um, advertising using Twitter bots. They actually hired a, a quite well-known bot-making duo for that. Um, and the British Heart Foundation in the UK as a charity, they made a cool Twitter bot to raise awareness of heart disease. Um, the illustration here is kind of shameless promotion, but it is it is the favorite bot I ever made, um, was a bot that created uh, burgers um, from uh, the cartoon series, uh, Bob's Burgers. So it made burgers that had pun names like they do in the TV show. So this was once upon a time in America, um, but the burger comes with time. Um, the really important thing to know about Twitter bots is that people are getting into generative software because of Twitter bots, um, and that is really important. Making Twitter bots has become very easy thanks to the work of the community and a couple of people in particular that I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Um, and now Twitter bot, like Twitter bot making workshops is a big part of lots of tech events around the world. And um, one of the reasons why this website that I'm about to tell you about has 7,000 users is because so many people are learning how to make bots. And that is, that is something that should not and cannot be ignored uh, for people in our community. Um, Tony has already mentioned this if you came to his uh, tutorial at the early, early part of the week, but uh, Cheap Bots Done Quick, which is run by um, V21 uh, on Twitter, and uh, Tracery, which powers the website um, that was made by Kate Compton, Galaxy Kate. Um, 
the website is uh, just makes it very, very simple to sign up to Twitter and instantly make a bot. Like you could easily do it in the remaining like 15 minutes of my uh, talk slot. Um, and it really kind of transformed Twitter bot making for a lot of people. Um, so this was a really vital, vital part of the community. Um, I just had a couple of things. Obviously, I, I've talked to you about cheat bots done quick. You should definitely go there and have a look at it. You should get your students to use it. It's an amazing tool for like getting undergrads to quickly knock together something and then think about grammars or think about possibility space. Um, the other interesting thing about the community is they're very good at creating and sharing resources. So um, Darius Kazemi, for instance, has made this GitHub called Corpora. And um, people from the community donate all kinds of data that they've cleaned up. Um, there's like a list of, this is from the food uh, folder, there's like a list of fruits, there's a list of herbs and spices, um, there's um, a list of like foreign films with the languages that they were made in and the year they were made. There's um, a list of uh, cities from different parts of the world, like there's all this, these amazing, there's a list of tarot cards with interpretations for every tarot card, that's my favourite one in the, in the corpora I think. Um, it's an amazing resource, and this is part of the kind of community building itself, supporting itself, helping each other, um, which is super important. A um, couple of bots that I really like. Uh, the Ephemerides is by Alison Parrish, and it mirrors, it, it maps up um, generated poetry with photographs of um, space and uh, objects in space, um, which is extremely beautiful. Um, there's one here, I, I've got some time, so I'll, I'll read it out because uh, we're on YouTube. So, uh, atmospheric circulation are by sails cleared away, Libra being frequently far beyond an intense crimson colour. So the poetry doesn't always make sense, but occasionally it resonates. I've, I've written about this um, at, at length, um, and when it, when it hits, it really pairs well with the image as well in particular. It's a great mirror, like it's a great um, marrying of like two different forms in one Twitter bot, which I, I'm a big fan of. Another interesting um, uh, kind of unexpected bot, I would say, is Botgul. Um, I haven't done the slide properly, so the, all the images have overlaid each other. But Botgul is a way of playing the board game Boggle on Twitter. Um, and it posts a board three times a day, I think, or maybe four times a day. And it has a very nice community of people who post uh, words and get scores. At the end of every month, it gives like a monthly rundown of all the people that played. And it's even spawned other bots to help augment its work, which is extremely cool. Um, and Bot in the Woods is um, a bot that I only discovered yesterday. It generates these 3D forests and then records a very short five-second GIF of someone walking through them and posts that. Um, I think it's incredible. Like you just Every day, you can just trip over a new amazing bot. Um, I am contractually obliged to remind you that uh, Tony Veal and I have written a book about Twitter bots. It's coming out in September from MIT Press. And um, actually, my, my main contribution to the book has been writing some chapters about the community, the Twitter bot community, the history, um, some famous bots, interviews with bot makers, things like that. So um, if you've in if you'd like this section of the talk, uh, I encourage you to check out the book. The last community I want to talk about is the National Novel Generating Month. So uh, if you are familiar with NaNoWriMo, it's based off that. Um, but if you're not, NaNoWriMo is a, a challenge where people write a 50,000 word novel in one month. And NaNoGenMo is a event based on that where people generate a 50,000 word novel. Um, and it's a pretty small community compared to um, the others that we've looked at. It has kind of a few dozen core members and some people that kind of drop in and out. It, but it's a really fascinating creative exercise. And of all of the communities here, if you're interested in narrative or text generation or poetry, you should be looking at NanoGenma because the people there are extremely creative and um, it's very, very funny and fun. Um, the submission is the novel. It's not actually the code. So everything else that we've looked at so far, most people kind of share code. Um, people do share code in NanoGenmo, but the important thing is the 50,000 word novel, and that completely changes how everyone works um, when they enter this, this event. Um, this illustration is from Dial S for Sudoku, um, which is a novel about a woman filling in a Sudoku with painstaking descriptions, and also occasionally she starts daydreaming about like someone called Bob or um, her children and things like that. It's, um, it's amazing. Like I'll just read a quick thing. It says, Alice refocused her attention on the puzzle. Most of the puzzle was still unsolved. She found that cell E5 could only contain a 3. All other digits were blocked somehow. 
So th this novel really is like an intense novelization of solving a Sudoku with these occasional uh, interjections, which I find amazing. Um, I also think it's interesting that when you think about a lot of text generation, um, a lot of us focus on, well, let me use an example from my work. So I work in game generation, and a lot of the games that we generate are very simple. No one tries to generate a 50-hour um, RPG epic. Um, and similarly, I think it's safe to say that uh, in most text generation poetry stories, we mostly try and generate fairly short ones. No one tries to generate Moby Dick. Um, but this this event is about just that, and um, it forces people to get really uh, creative and um, think outside the box, and it also re results in lots of funny um, submissions. I've chosen another kind of funny one here. Um, they're not all funny, I want to stress that. There are some really clever uh, systems, but obviously I wanted to make you laugh today. So um, this one is called Pride, Comma, Prejudice, and um, it's created a 50,000 word novel by taking Pride and Prejudice and then shortening it. Um, so you end up with uh, a, a story that has a lot of bizarre abbreviations and summaries and uh, uses like text summarization tools and contractions. Um, it reads slightly like it was uh, written in a Yorkshire dialect now. There's lots of like t and apostrophes to shorten certain phrases. Um, that's really great. So uh, you should go and look at all of these. They're all on their GitHub. Um, just a couple of more um, ones that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I could not avoid talking about Annals of the Pariegs. Um, it's one of my favorite generative works that I've seen recently by Emily Short. Um, this is a kind of a, a travel guide um, that also kind of tells the story of the places that this, these people are traveling through. It's, it's really complicated and beautiful and it's illustrated. It has these nice like semi-illustrated, uh, semi-illuminated uh, text effects in some places and um, the format of travel writing uh, works perfectly for generated text, and Emily's done a really interesting job of weaving um, her like different kinds of rarity in the generated text. Um, it's it's a really you have to read it to kind of appreciate it. I think there's a little excerpt here that you can that you can see, um, but. There's a lot of really interesting uses of form in this piece. Um, another one that I really liked that I found was the Dungeon Crawler game book. So um, this was not a novel in the classical sense. It was more like a choose your own adventure. And every time you read it, this one is a little bit different because you actually can generate new ones um, uh, very easily just by going to the website. Um, uh, but this is like a full playable dungeon with uh, turn to page, except that they're hyperlinks. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of monsters and treasures and things like that that you can find and interesting descriptions of all the different parts of the dungeon. Um, again, like a, a creative choice of target and not something that we've particularly tried generating in computational creativity. So that's the, the, the fun part of the talk, I think, um, or the most fun part, uh, is looking at all the different communities and what they do. But um, in the paper, I also, we, we try to talk about what we think computational creativity can learn from these communities um, and maybe what it can bring to them. And there is more detail in the paper, but obviously I wanted to talk about some stuff today. Um, the first one is accessibility. Um, this one had uh, a different title originally, um, which is Mere Generation Needs to Go. Uh, and that's because this community, um, like it or not, we have an image problem. Um, and I know that uh, I was talking to Anna Jordanas before I came to the, to the conference, and um, I'm sure that in some ways it has improved, but uh, everyone I talk to outside of this community about this community uh, kind of has a bad image of us. And I think we've got to think about that. Um, the phrase mere generation definitely needs to be phased out. Um, I actually have not heard it much this conference, which is a great sign. Um, but uh, the problem is that we used it for too long and it now is kind of an albatross around our necks and people think we say it all the time even if we don't. And we need to reflect on that. Um, and we need to reflect not just on that phrase, but what it says about us. Um, we have a reputation for being very strict towards new submissions, new people, demanding they cite the right papers and, and use the right phrases. And I'm not suggesting that we throw out the rule book and that, you know, every academic field has some expectations, but we need to re-examine what it means to come to computational creativity as a newcomer. And I don't mean as the PhD student of someone who is already in this community. I mean someone walking in off the street with a paper who is interested in our work because we're interesting, we're cool, people want to submit to us, and um, we need to think about that. Um, and maybe one of the things we need to think about 
It's more casual ways to get involved. Maybe it's more tracks. Maybe it's more workshops for things that um, have maybe a less of an expectation of knowing all of our theory. Uh, maybe we have exhibitions. I was thinking like next year, if you want to set up like five machines in a demo area, I'll download a hundred PropCham submissions for you and people can just go nuts in the break and they can just play all the cool things that PropCham has made. Um, so th these are the kinds of things I need, think we need to think about is if someone wanted to get in involved in computational creativity, maybe they're not an academic or maybe they are, but not directly involved with our field. How, how would they get in? Um, and I think another thing we need to think about is when we, we say that, you know, we can't agree on the definition of creativity and that is healthy and that's good and it makes for fun Q&A, um, but it's very bad for a peer review process. Peer review is bad anyway, but in computational creativity, it is really problematic because all of us have different ideas about what this field is. And if you get the wrong match of paper and reviewer, you are getting rejected from this conference, my friend. Um, and I think also in, in the calls for papers, I think our call for paper has improved over the years, but um, we need to understand that like this is kind of a minefield. Um, and I think it would be good if we set more clear boundaries for our reviewers, actually kind of brief them. I think maybe we do need to do that here. Um, and also relaxing our criteria for submission. And basically what I'd rather that we got like a lot of irrelevant submissions um, that we had to throw out, but also the one that the one person that was going to be put off from submitting is encouraged to submit. And that's like a really valuable new submission that we get and that, that's really good. Um, so I think we need to think about that. Um, resources. So I talked about it mostly in the Twitter bots thing and a little bit in PropJam, but a really good thing that these communities are good at is creating resources and sharing them with one another. Um, it doesn't just save time, but it, it does, which is great. Um, but when people come to the community, it allows them to get up to speed faster, to create things quickly. Um, and also the resources get shared outside because they're really useful. I just showed you Darius's uh, resources and that promotes their community. And it lets people know about where those resources came from. So it would promote us. Um, we already have some great online resources. Um, the Prosecco archives, for instance, uh, Tony Veal has these nice web tools. He's talked about his GitHub repos as well. Um, and I think we need, we need more centralization and we need more promotion of these resources. And maybe we need a way to actually incentivize people who um, to do it. So possibly a track IEEC. I promise not all of my solutions uh, are, are to add a track to IEEC. But maybe, maybe we should have like a resources panel or a resources section next year. Um, also, maybe competition-like events. Um, they're, they're tricky. I have mixed feelings about them. But one thing they're quite good at is forcing um, a bunch of people to kind of create a template for something because you need a template to enter a competition often. So, you know, this works very well for games. Everyone creates like a template platformer that the competition entrants can use. And that has a knock-on effect in future research because even if you're not entering the competition, you can use this, um, this template and it makes it easier to compare people's work. So that could be something that we should think about more maybe. And the final kind of section for this talk is um, to get everyone involved more. So. A lot of the communities I've listed today have crossover. So Janelle Shane, who I mentioned in Creative AI, is speaking at PropJam this year, has, uh, has like, I think, entered it before. Um, uh, obviously, uh, Emily Short spoke at PropJam, uh, has entered PropJam, also enters NanoGenmo. Um, many of the Twitterbot authors enter Twitterbots into PropJam. They're also in Creative AI. Many of them have entered NanoGenmo. Um, and this cross-pollination is super important. People meet each other, people from different areas. PropJam brings in like literary study um, people who write awesome articles for seeds and then get inspired by people making music generators and stuff. Um, we need you guys to go out into those spaces as well. Um, it will really help not only um, for you, you will get a lot out of it, but also it will help us um, promote our computational creativity and raise awareness. Um, if you want to enter ProcJam, the next one coming up is in October. It is really relaxed. You can bring existing work in. You can just do a bit of research for a week and then post what you did, like that's fine. Um, but uh, I would implore you to join and join the community chat. We have a Discord, you can come and chat with people and uh, obviously the hashtag is great too. I also think that a lot of these events, like they set unusual goals and they have weird formats and it really encourages people to sort of rapidly jam things out. Um, and we actually wrote a paper, um, some games researchers, about jamming as an academic thing, like having it at conferences even. Um, we concluded that having it at conferences is usually too tiring, um, but what we should possibly do is organize a dark store that is focused on practical work. 
um, and kind of spend a week hacking together systems, hacking together competition uh, templates, hacking together resources. I think that would be really good. Um, and finally, I, I was talking to Alex Champendard and um, he suggested that ICCC needs to get out there more. So that's both the conference and you folk individually. So maybe the conference should try locating itself somewhere else, maybe a major event like a film festival, um, uh, maybe big creative AI hubs like New York. Um, but also, like, we all need to get our work out there more. We need to stream, make videos, write blogs, release things. We need to get things out so that people can see what we're doing, touch it, play with it, interact with it, maybe even see the code. Um, that's really important. So these neighboring communities are amazing. They are full of great ideas. They are full of amazing people. They are full of inspiring work. It doesn't all have to be deeply computationally creative to have a profound impact on the way that you think about your research. Um, and also, these are the people we want to be the future of our field. Um, and so I think they are super important for us to know about. They're also run in really interesting ways. And understanding how they're run, uh, I think, can help us improve the way we run our community. We do have an image problem. AI is effortless to sell these days. Uh, this was something we were discussing in the poster session. And yet, despite the fact that every AI community is gr growing and exploding, uh, we aren't. And there are various reasons for that. They're not all on us, but we also should re-examine how um, we solve our image problem where it exists. And um, I, I don't want us to just like aim to become a bigger academic conference. I want us to aim to be weird. I want us to aim to be more ICCC um, and to do kind of unusual things. And maybe that's jams, maybe that's um, going out there and entering prop jam every year. I don't know. Um, but uh, Read the paper, there's a lot more stuff in there. Um, if you want to talk to me, obviously I'm always on Twitter, you can email me, um, and uh, there's some links to various things there. Thank you so much for listening.